we have a year or two here to have a fairly traditional bubble losing air, a fairly traditional recession, and fairly traditional decline in profit margins and some grief in the stock market. And we can do that before the real effects of AI kick in. He is known for his prescient calls on market extremes and turning points. On Wealth Track, a rare interview with legendary value investor Jeremy Grantham. Funding provided by Clearbridge Investments, First Eagle Investments, Royce Investment Partners, Baird, Matthews Asia, Strategus Asset Management, and Women Investing in Security and Education. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. You are in for a treat as we launch our new season today, a rare interview with investment legend Jeremy Grantham. He was our guest at our season premiere in 2021, so we decided it is time for an update. For those of you not familiar with Grantham, he is a longtime value investor, co-founder of the global investment management firm GMO, where his title is now long-term investment strategist, having been its chief investment strategist for many years. He no longer manages money at GMO, but oversees the Grantham Family Foundation, which is totally devoted to fighting climate change and is investing 75% of its funds in green venture capital companies. Grantham is known for his far-seeing calls about market extremes and game-changing turning points. He warned of the tech stock bubble in 1997, three years before it actually burst, and that early call cost GMO half of their asset allocation book of business at the time. In the late 2000s, he warned of the developing subprime mortgage and credit bubble and came close to timing the actual 2008 bull market peak. He then nailed the market bottom nearly to the day in March of 2009. When he appeared on WealthTrack in 2018, he predicted a possible market melt-up, a powerful late-stage two- to three-year-long market rally before a decline. He got the melt-up right, even with the brief 2020 pandemic-induced bear market. Well, Grantham appeared on Wealth Truck again in 2021, mourning of a bubble of epic proportions because an unprecedented three and a half different markets were trading at extremes. The bond market, remember interest rates at 5,000-year lows. The stock market, think meme stocks and SPACs. The housing market and its bidding wars and some metal and agricultural commodities. For the most part, these pricey assets got their comeuppance in 2022 with major corrections, but they have rebounded since. What does Grantham think about those bubbles now? We started with the stock market. Well, it's been, uh, until very recently, working through in a, a very traditional way. As you know, I'm only interested in, in the really great bubbles like 1929, 2000, and 2021 are the three senior bubbles in US uh, stock market. We have checked off pretty well every one of the boxes. Uh, they, both, they all three followed long economic, economic upswings, very strong bull market in the stock market, uh, very strong earnings, almost perfect economic financial conditions by the top of the cycle. Uh, they all had a sharp leg down. Um, they've had pretty good rallies. In 29, they had a 42% rally. In 2001, they had a 25% rally. And I believe the S&P had about a 20% rally a week ago. Uh, and the NASDAQ has done considerably better. So all, all present and correct. Uh, I'm a little bit disturbed by the emergence of the kind of mini bubble in artificial intelligence, trying to work out will that be quick enough and strong enough to alter the final stage of, of this bubble, which is always the longest and most difficult one to predict because it depends on the fundamentals. How quickly and how long will the economy go down? How low will profit margins fall? They have fallen a decent bit already, but they could do a lot worse. And uh, how badly other economic variables will be, the trouble with uh, in global trade, the trouble with China, the trouble with the war, and uh, how will that play out? Very difficult to tell. I think the history says if you handle the economy 
very badly, you might end up like 1929. If you handle it pretty well, like 2000, you still get a respectable recession, one that will uh, do the job and bring the market down. 2001 was about as easy a recession as you will ever get, a genteel recession, and still the NASDAQ came down 82%. Are we in a bear market rally? Is that what's going on? So th therefore, this is a continuation of the bursting of the bubbles that you had warned about? I, I would say so. Okay. However, my, my probabilities that had climbed to 85% likely, which is ridiculously high, I was very confident that this was deflating in the typical way. And, and that probability has probably backed off to about 70%, mm -hmm. which is still higher than a lot of people ever get to. And the reason it's backed off is because of uh, artificial intelligence. So is AI the big complication and explain uh, what's going on with AI and, and why it is interfering with the normal course of events as bubbles unravel? Yes, well, Lord knows this was complicated before AI raised its ugly head <laughs> because we had inflation, the Fed, how quickly would rates go up? How far would they go up? How would the war play out? Oh my hat, it, it goes on and on. So it right. was complicated enough. And now we have since chat GBT in October, November of last year, we have a new little flurry of, of interest, very concentrated. Uh, the NASDAQ is up 25% more than the Russell 2000 this year, which is about a world record. Mm -hmm. uh, to imagine a, a NASDAQ up 30 and the Russell 2000 up five, I mean, this is, uh, it's not unprecedented because it, it happened uh, somewhat similarly in, in 2000, but it's, it's a very big divergence. So artificial intelligence is, has the biggest scrambling of opinions, doesn't it, about the future that one yes. has ever seen. I mean, there are really some of the brightest people on the planet saying it's all nonsense, it's just a parrot learning by trial and error, and uh, other people saying it will change everything it will double productivity for decades and everybody in between. Where and, do you and this come is, out? And this is not my specialty, but what my specialty is, is to go out further than other people. And I would say this, that if you can chain link a million machines so that they all learn the same thing at the same time, they all acquire any information that any of them acquire, this is a pretty unequal struggle with human beings. And, and, and it's been an advantage that computers had for the last 60 years, but it didn't matter because the computers were stupid. And now what's happened is they're kind of uh, arming that huge advantage by making the computer finally pretty smart. Smart. And there's only one direction that pretty smart is going to go, and that is into the very smart. So imagine a world where you have a million devices that all learn everything simultaneously, and they have acquired an IQ of 200. And, and this is where you start to panic, and you decide that you better destroy them or limit them quickly before they get ideas above their station. I, I completely get that. I don't think there is any chance over decades if society stays coherent. I don't think there's any chance that artificial intelligence and computing power will not come together in a way that will give them powers way in excess of human beings. And I agree with the group that says they should be regulated. However, I also look at Homo sapiens so far and, and think this is not our strength. This is not going to be easy and it's incredibly no. risky. What it means in the short term for the stock market is in comparison utterly trivial uh, in significance. But my guess is it's not operating on the time frame of this bubble. We have a year or two here to have a fairly traditional bubble losing air, a fairly traditional recession, and fairly traditional decline in profit margins and some grief in the stock market. And we can do that before the real effects of AI kick in, is my guess. 
except for the fact that we are having a huge rally in the mega cap stocks. They now comprise about 26% of the S&P 500. And we're seeing the kind of bubble effects that you have warned us about for several years now. So could that really throw this you know, bubble deflation scenario off and prolong this, uh, this rally, especially in, in the, the big tech stocks uh, for a while? I suspect it already has elongated this process uh, somewhat. And, and uh, there is some fairly small chance, I think, that it will mitigate it to such an extent that we will only have a modest decline. Um, it's very hard to tell. It's why I've taken my probabilities back from 85% certain to 70% certain. So there was a recent Wall Street Journal article that said, you know, the mega caps might be 25 some odd percent of the market, but in fact, in individual investors' portfolios, they are 50% of individual investors' portfolios. So, you know, as a, a long-term strategist, um, looking at the short term, what would your advice be to individual investors? A good reflex would be to think that they've been extremely lucky. They have uh, played right into uh, the strong speculation around artificial intelligence. They've made an unprecedented 25% over anything. And I would have, at the very least, handsomely take profits if I were them. The climate change is a passion of yours. The Grantham Family Foundation is investing uh, you know, totally, or 75% in uh, venture capital uh, it, devoted to battling climate change. Uh, it's it's a, a, an issue that you saw coming a long time ago. I mean, so let's talk about climate change and um, how you're investing uh, in that area to, to mitigate the effects of climate change. And just a word about passion for climate change. The reason yes. we're focused is we considered it to be uh, a real threat to the continued well-being of global society right. and, and, and a deadly threat getting bigger by the minute. Anyone can see it. In, in almost every day's newspaper, droughts, floods, fires, really coming along at a, a tragically fast pace. And the last 12 months has really impacted global GDP, probably for the first time enough to count Mm -hmm. I would guess a little less than half a percent of global GDP has been knocked off really? by uh, mainly the agricultural impact, but all the impacts of climate change. So the only reason we are, quote, passionate about it is because it was the most obvious threat and one that we thought we could do something about. There, there are other, other threats around. We're right. also worried about the toxicity in the the growing toxicity at, at, at a global level that is, uh, as far as one can tell, has knocked out something between 50 and 75 percent of the entire biomass of insects, which include pollinators. Mm -hmm. We have no the idea bees. what the world will look like if that right. doesn't stop. And it proceeds at 2 percent a year. So the loss, the loss to habitat and biomass is, is a real threat to our well-being also. And uh, what worries me is that these long-term threats, which include a limitation of, of suitable resources like metals and, and a limitation to human labor, the, the population of new babies is dropping like a stone in the developed world in China. Mm -hmm. uh, and our argument about the long term is now has to do with the fact that the other day, most of these seemed fairly distant. Right. Ti good time for an early warning. And suddenly, they're all upon us. The flip side of this, Jeremy, and I have to, you know, say because I can remember the, you know, the dire predictions about the world overpopulation. Well, now what we're facing uh, is those models were clearly wrong. Uh, now what we're facing is a decline in population, which actually should, uh, you know, should ameliorate some of the demands, right, for resources and food. And I mean, isn't that actually a positive? Yes, isn't it interesting it that is. we live in a world of such complications and paradoxes? There are two population problems in the world. One is an unsustainably high population growth in Africa, mm 
-hmm. and the other is a worryingly low uh, or worryingly high decline in baby cohorts in the developed world plus China. And why I worry about it as a climate change guy is that it's so steep. I think in five years, a lot of countries will think of themselves as so poor that can they really afford the trillions of dollars that must be found to green the global economy, uh. decarbonize it. We will find that some of them are quite rattled and maybe uh, that will include the US. In any case, our growth rate was heading downwards because of this pretty rapidly. And once again, what is AI going to do to that? What do we do with this in information as investors? I mean, if, you know, if the, it, certainly we can determine the existential threat that climate change represents, that, that these secular trends represent. But in the meantime, we are living in the here and now. You know, as human beings, we are innately hopeful, most of us. And, uh, and this is an investment program. So, uh, you know, what do we do with that information, this information, and these secular trends that you've identified uh, as investors? If you enjoy thinking about this kind of problem, you can quickly work out, for example, to take baby food. The, the growth rate in baby food will be strongly negative as far as the eye can see. And uh -huh. then you step that out through the supply lines of every product. And you find that with a declining population, it puts a very particular spin on the economy. And the people who benefit from sheer volume, making soups and uh, foods and packaged goods, lose their top line growth rate. And right. it becomes a declining growth rate and the fight for market share intensifies. These are, these are not uh, Nobel Prize winning conclusions. These are all pretty obvious. Uh, the other thing you realize is that the world is waking up and getting behind climate change. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the one serious problem that they have where they have gotten the point. And therefore, you have to realize that the top line revenue of everything concerned with climate change is going to be very much higher uh, than the rest. So EVs are going to grow the hell out of uh, piston engine vehicles and uh, solar and wind are going to show a much higher growth rate than coal, which is probably going to be strongly negative until it goes out of business in 20 or 30 years. Right. So these are fairly obvious. And uh, since climate change is such a big issue and will require quite a few trillions of dollars each year, it, it will dominate investment portfolio thinking, I believe. And uh, it's one of the reasons that I would own uh, something approaching a climate change fund. Uh, mm -hmm. GMO has one of these and it, it's done well. And it's one of only four funds out of 60 that the Grantham Foundation owns that come from uh, GMO. Uh -huh. One of my favorite economists, Kenneth Boulding, a fellow Yorkshireman from the north of England. He said, the only people who think you can have compound growth on a finite planet are madmen and economists. <laughs> uh, when, when I meet a denier, I like to say to them, and which are you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, because we are beginning to show signs since early this century, 2002. We're beginning to show signs that the era of declining prices and plentiful supply of commodities have simply, has simply stopped. In the 100 years up until 2002, the average important commodity declined by 70%. And the average important commodity since 2002 has, has almost tripled. This is a very different world. And right. there is not a plentiful supply of nickel, cadmium, lithium, copper, all the things we need to green the world. It is going to be a problem. We are going to need uh, ingenious engineering replacement substitutions and so on if we're going to get out of this in one piece. So one of the key questions that you have posed at GMO and in previous conversations with me is the, to identify where are the bottlenecks? So where are the bottlenecks uh, and the areas that would be attractive to invest in? And, and that's what becomes the guiding principle in the Grantham Foundation. 
uh-huh. in our venture capital, look out a few years and say, you know, you need an awful lot of lithium uh, to, to drive the world's electric cars. And we simply don't have anything like that in, in the reserves that can be obtained at anything approaching a reasonable price. So what are we going to do? We have a, an investment in extracting lithium at two or three times the efficiency uh, from, uh, from brine. We have one that increases the efficiency 50% in rock. But the real payoff is the next generation where we don't have an investment, and that is in sodium ion. Sodium is a thousand times more plentiful than lithium. And that's the kind of, of tilting you have to do. Lithium in a perfect world is slightly more efficient. But when you have a thousand times more of it, you can afford to be a little less efficient. And they're the kind of tricks we have to pull. And it's not just lithium, it's everything. Copper and nickel, People think of them as plentiful. They, they are very scarce. On, in the Earth's crust, they are 0.006. Uh, aluminum is 6.5%, and iron ore is over 4%, and they are 0.006%. You can add up 20 of the coppers, nickels, molybdenum, lithium, gold, silver. You can add up 20 of those, and they're a tiny, tiny fraction of iron ore uh, in terms of wow. total availability. People don't realize. No. They are, they are really running out. Mm-hmm. You better make sure everything is made of iron and aluminum <laughs> if, you mean, if you mean to uh, be successful. Right. Th- these are not clean materials. These are not, you know, environmentally friendly materials either. So you're kind of, are you making a bargain with, the devil by in order to get to the ultimate goal, which is to go electric, to go green, that you've got to use these materials to get there until we have new technologies that uh, eliminate the need for them. You're pushing me into a kind of Churchillian position where he said that if uh, Hitler invaded hell, he would find a way of mentioning the devil uh, um, in a positive light in his daily dispatches. Yes, if I had to make a deal with the devil right. um, in, in order to green the entire global system, I would seriously read the footnotes. I mean, I'd have to consider it. You, you can't possibly green a system as complicated as we as- have and, and decarbonize the whole thing without a lot of dirty, messy metals playing a role. They are simply necessary. And what you have to do is say, what is at the top of the list? What is the most urgent thing you have to do? If we don't fix climate change, the planet starts to die, and you'll have people dying of heat and humidity on the Indian subcontinent within 50 years at a routine basis. We have to fix this problem, or civilization as we know it kind of goes out of business. And and I think we will. I mean, I, I think we're not complete idiots. And the question is, in this, what I call race of our lives, is our inventiveness going to be quick enough, important enough uh, to save us from our total incompetence at at dealing with long-term strategies? Jeremy, we always ask such a mundane question considering the topics we've been discussing, but uh, if there's one investment for a long-term diversified portfolio, that we should all own some of, and of course, long-term is very relative considering what you're talking about, uh, what would it be? I would do climate and resources for the, for the reasons that must be obvious from the conversation. Uh, tuck them away. They will be the beneficiaries of shortage in the case of resources, which is always good for profits, and uh, government action and growing urgency from everybody in the case of climate change. They actually interrelate quite a lot. Jeremy Grantham, always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, you know, you're a bubble spotter and you're also a climate change uh, warrior. So thank you very much for joining us on Wealth Track. It's a great pleasure, as always. At the close of every Wealth Track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is steep yourself in market history. 
Historical perspective is all too rare on Wall Street, which is why we make a concerted effort to bring some to you on Wealth Track. You can read some finance classics and or watch their authors interviewed on WealthTrack.com. Bert Malkiel on the 50th anniversary of his A Random Walk Down Wall Street. Charlie Ellis on his Winning the Losers Game, Timeless Strategies for Successful Investing. Bob Alaber on his updated edition of Manias, Panics, and Crashes, A History of Financial Crises. And Neil Ferguson discussing his The Ascent of Money, A Financial History of the World. Understanding financial history and how humans behave in it can help all of us become better investors. Next week, an exclusive interview with small cap pioneer Chuck Royce on how he has beaten the market during his 50 plus years of running the Pennsylvania Mutual Fund. In this week's extra feature, Jeremy Grantham shares the developments he is most excited about in his battle against climate change. In the meantime, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Thank you for sharing your time with us. Have a fun and festive 4th of July weekend and make the week ahead a healthy, profitable, and productive one.